Hi everyone, this is Vivek Kulkarni with USMLE Rx, and now that we've finished the inflammation section of pathology, it's time to move on to neoplasia. Before we get started, if you need a break, go ahead, pause the lecture, get a snack, go to the bathroom, watch some TV, whatever you want. I'll be here when you get back. All right, ready to go? Neoplasia is a hugely important topic, both for the exam and for your future career. Cancer remains a significant killer in the U.S. and the world, and a good understanding of how cancer develops, progresses, and can be treated will help you not just to do well in the exam, but to be a good doctor. Unfortunately, in the context of the exam, there are a lot of specific details that you'll need to know, and you'll see that in this section, we're going to focus on those details. There are lots of lists and tables that you'll need to memorize. As we go through, we'll focus on the concepts. We'll mention the specifics that you need to know, but we'll spend more time on the processes and ideas, using questions and mini cases like before. The first thing to understand about neoplasia is what actually happens. One day, cells are perfectly fine. Then, a little while later, there's a giant tumor. How does that crazy transformation happen? First of all, there have to be mutations that let the cells evade the body's natural mechanisms for preventing cancer. Normally, cells grow in response to growth signals, but in a limited way, and there are lots of anti-growth signals that can limit growth, and even apoptotic signals that can cause cells to die. Cancer cells develop mutations that allow them to escape these defense mechanisms. They can evade apoptosis, they can grow without growth signals, they can ignore anti-growth signals, and they can stimulate their own never-ending blood supply. What makes things worse, cancers also develop the ability to break out of the tissue where they normally live and cause complete devastation to the entire body. It is really scary how much these little cells can do. This page goes through a typical progression for an epithelial cell cancer, known as a carcinoma. We'll get to the nomenclature in a little bit, but for now, let's focus on the progression. Normally, epithelial cells are well differentiated and stay separated from underlying tissue with a basement membrane. Early on, some of these cells acquire mutations that allow them to divide more than they should, leading to hyperplasia, or to divide abnormally quickly, leading to dysplasia. As these cells continue dividing, they acquire more mutations, and eventually the whole area is filled with these neoplastic cells. This state is called carcinoma in situ, which literally means cancer in one place. The picture shows ductal carcinoma in situ, a common type of breast cancer. Next, the cells can acquire a mutation that allows them to invade through the basement membrane, at which point the mass becomes a locally invasive cancer. These mutations are usually enzymes like collagenase or hydrolase, which makes sense since the basement membrane is basically collagen held together by bonds that can be hydrolyzed. Finally, the cells can acquire a mutation that allow them to survive in a distant location, which is manifested clinically as a metastasis. One thing you should remember about metastasis is that carcinomas typically spread through lymphatic vessels, while sarcomas typically spread through blood vessels. The information on this page is really important. Let me say that again. The information on this page is really important. In fact, it's so important that before we move on, let's use a mini case to drill things home. Ready? A 52-year-old man comes into your office after seeing blood in the toilet bowl. He's never had a colonoscopy, and his father died of colon cancer at age 60. Which of the following, if related to underlying malignancy, would be most concerning? Diarrhea, constipation, jaundice, or anemia? This is a tough question. If we're worried that this patient has colon cancer, any of these symptoms could arise, but metastatic colon cancer would be the most concerning since it would be a sign of very advanced neoplastic progression. Diarrhea, constipation, and anemia can all be explained by cancer limited to the GI tract, but jaundice would mean that the cancer has metastasized to the liver and would carry with it a pretty bad prognosis. Great job! Remember, you should understand the neoplastic progression very well, so please spend enough time on this to understand it. All the words that end in plasia can be pretty confusing. If you haven't ever studied Latin or Greek, good for you. That helps a little bit. But if you haven't, don't worry there are only a few things you need to remember. The first term, hyperplasia, means that the cell number is increasing. Hyper means more, like hyperkalemia means more potassium. There are lots of examples of this, and sometimes they're completely benign. 
Remember that this is different from hypertrophy, which is when the cells increase in size but not number. The second term, metaplasia, means that there is a change from one normal cell type to another. Meta means change, like metamorphosis. One common example of metaplasia is Barrett's esophagus, shown here. The normal cell type of the esophagus, stratified squamous epithelium, is replaced by columnar epithelium, which is normal looking but doesn't belong there. This is often triggered by some exposure or irritation. In the case of Barrett's, it's chronic exposure to gastric acid. Dysplasia means that the growth of cells is abnormal. Dys means that something is abnormal, like in dysfunction. Cells lose their normal characteristics, and they look disorganized, chaotic, and a little disgusting. This is usually a precursor to cancer. The next three plasias are all irreversible. The first is anaplasia, shown here. Ana means backwards, so anaplasia is when cells regress to become undifferentiated. In neoplasia, cells grow out of control. Neo means new, and in neoplasia, new cells continue to grow without any regard for signals or growth factors. The last one is desmoplasia. You probably won't need to know this one, so just remember that this refers to fibrous tissue formation. And honestly, I don't know what desmo means. When classifying different tumors, the two major systems are grade and stage. Each individual tumor has distinct criteria that determine exactly what grade and stage it is, and you shouldn't even try to learn them all unless you want to be an oncologist. Even then, wait until your fellowship. For now, remember the basics. Grade is based on how nice the tumor looks under the microscope. More organized is low grade, and more chaotic is high grade. The most important thing to remember about grade is that it does not typically have value in prognosis. That's where stage comes in. Tumor stage is based on the macroscopic features of the tumor. Although the specifics vary with each tumor, stage typically uses the so-called TNM staging system. T for tumor size, N for node involvement, and M for metastasis. Stage is used to stratify patients based on prognosis and also used to dictate different levels of treatment. Large tumors are worse than small, more lymph nodes are worse than a few, and metastasis is worse than localized disease. Let's just reiterate that one more time. Stage is macroscopic and used for prognosis, whereas grade is microscopic and not used for prognosis.